Pacifica. This is Democracy Now! Every single person that I've talked to so far has made the mention that I don't know why it's doing what it's doing. It's burning differently. It's burning uh, more aggressive um, than, than it has in years past. And I know we say that every year, but it, it's, it's unprecedented. Fire tornadoes. That's the term being used to describe some of the wildfires in California that have killed more than eight people, destroyed more than a thousand homes. Sixteen fires are still burning across California. 320,000 acres have already been scorched. This comes as heat records are being made across the country and world. In India, more than 500 people have died as a result of flooding and heavy rains in recent weeks. Today, it's climate change for the hour. Uh, we're in quite a cycle, uh, but the predictions that I see that the more serious uh, predictions of uh, warming and fires uh, to occur later in the century, uh, 2040 or 2050, they're now occurring uh, in real time. And you can expect, unfortunately, uh, that to keep intensifying in California and throughout the Southwest. We'll speak with climate scientist Brenda Eckwurzel, Rob Nixon, author of Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, and Nathaniel Rich. He's the author of the New York Times Magazine piece, Losing Earth, The Decade We Almost Stopped Climate Change. It's only the second time in Times history they've dedicated the entire magazine to a single article. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. President Donald Trump called Wednesday for his attorney general to immediately end special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election, prompting critics to charge the president is guilty of obstructing justice. In a Wednesday morning tweet storm, Trump wrote, This is a terrible situation, and Attorney General Jeff Sessions should stop this rigged witch hunt right now, before it continues to stain our country any further. Congressmember Adam Schiff, the ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, responded, this is an attempt to obstruct justice hiding in plain sight. America must never accept it. At the White House, senior administration officials claimed Trump was merely expressing an opinion. This is White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Look, the president is not obstructing. He's fighting back. The president is stating his opinion. He's stating it clearly. Uh, and he's certainly expressing the frustration that he has uh, with the level of corruption that we've seen from people like Jim Comey, Peter Strzok, Andrew McCabe. President Trump's call for an end to the Mueller probe came on the second day of his former campaign manager's trial in Alexandria, Virginia. Paul Manafort faces 18 charges, including tax fraud, bank fraud and money laundering. Prosecutors told a jury Manafort hid much of the $60 million he earned from lobbying as an unregistered foreign agent on behalf of pro-Russia Ukrainian officials by stashing it in undisclosed overseas accounts. Witnesses describe Manafort as spending lavishly from the accounts on cars, luxury goods, home renovations, even a $15,000 ostrich skin leather jacket. President Trump weighed in on the trial in a tweet suggesting Manafort is being treated worse in jail than the notorious mobster Al Capone. In South Texas, the American Immigration Lawyers Association says a migrant toddler who is separated from her family as part of the President Trump's zero-tolerance border policy died shortly after being released from the Dilly Family Detention Center. Houston-based lawyer Mani Agani tweeted, the child died following her stay at an ICE detention center as a result of possible negligent care and a respiratory illness she contracted from one of the other children, unquote. Last year, lawyers with the ACLU and several other groups sued ICE, alleging it had been violating its own policy by locking up pregnant women at Dilly and four other immigration jails. The death came as about 700 children forcibly separated from their parents at the border have still not been reunited with them.
A federal court has declared President Trump's executive order withholding funds from sanctuary cities in California unconstitutional. However, Wednesday's ruling by a three-judge panel on the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals will lift a nationwide injunction against Trump's crackdown on sanctuary cities. A lower court is now slated to consider reimposing that injunction. Cities across California and in many, many other states have passed sanctuary city policies, barring local police from cooperating with federal immigration agencies. The New York Times reports the Trump administration's considering a plan to sharply reduce the number of refugees allowed to settle in the United States. The plan, which has the support of Trump's anti-immigrant senior policy adviser Stephen Miller, would cap the number of refugees resettled next year to 25,000, a 40 percent drop from the current cap. The number of refugees allowed into the U.S. by the Trump administration has slowed to a near trickle, with the country already on pace to allow in the fewest number number of refugees since the Federal Refugee Resettlement Program was created in 1980. In Zimbabwe's capital, Harare, soldiers and police used tear gas, water cannons and live ammunition Wednesday to clear protesters who'd taken to the streets to allege Monday's presidential and parliamentary vote was rigged. At least three people were shot dead, scores more left injured, many of them filmed being beaten by soldiers. A spokesperson for the opposition party, Movement for Democratic Change, called the violence an attack on democracy. The deployment of military tanks and firing of live ammunition on civilians for no apparent reason. Civilians are allowed to demand the respect of their rights in a lawful manner. Any disorder may be dealt with by the police who are best trained for public order. Soldiers are trained to kill during war. We are seriously made to wonder what this means. Are we in war? Are civilians the enemy of the state? The deadly crackdown on protests came after election returns showed President Emerson Mnangagwa's ruling ZANU-PF party is heading for a large parliamentary majority. There's been no announcement of a winner in the presidential race, prompting international election observers to question the credibility of the vote. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, a new investigation by Vice News bolsters evidence of ethnic cleansing of the Hema ethnic minority in the eastern Aturi province. The violence began last December as hundreds of machete-wielding militiamen swept through areas west of Lake Albert on Congo's border with Uganda. About 120 communities were attacked, with hundreds killed, thousands of homes destroyed and some 350,000 people displaced. Investigative journalist Nick Terse reports the violence came after the U.S. abruptly cut support for peacekeeping efforts last year as part of President Trump's America First policies. President Trump doubled down on his growing trade war with China Wednesday, threatening to increase tariffs on a range of Chinese products from 10 percent to 25 percent. The tariffs would target some $200 billion of Chinese goods. Trump launched a tit-for-tat series of tariffs after talks with Beijing broke down in May, prompting what Chinese officials have called the largest trade war in economic history. Google's preparing to launch a service in China that allow Chinese censors to block search terms about human rights, democracy, religion and peaceful protests. That's according to The Intercept, which reports the project, codenamed Dragonfly, was launched in the spring of last year and accelerated after Google's CEO met with a top Chinese government official in December. In response, Patrick Poon of Amnesty International told The Intercept, quote, the biggest search engine in the world obeying the censorship in China is a victory for the Chinese government. It's sends a signal that nobody will bother to challenge the censorship anymore, he said. Amnesty International says hackers recently targeted one of its staffers in a sophisticated surveillance effort by a hostile government to spy on the group's work. The staffer, who was working on a campaign calling for the release of jailed women's rights activists in Saudi Arabia, received an anonymous message in Arabic in the WhatsApp smartphone application. The message was found to contain a link that would install the malware program Pegasus, developed by an Israeli cyber intelligence firm, which allows a third party to spy extensively on an encrypted phone's calls, photos and messages. Amnesty warns the attack was likely part of a much broader effort to spy on activists in several countries across Asia, Africa and Europe.
The Trump administration's cleared the way for insurance companies to expand their sales of inexpensive health care plans that circumvent many of the protections of the Affordable Care Act. Under the new rules, health insurers can sell plans originally designed for short-term use for up to 12 months, with an option to renew each year. The plans don't have to cover pre-existing conditions and often exclude coverage for prescription drugs, mental health and maternity care. Pope Francis has declared the Catholic Church will oppose the death penalty in all instances, calling it an attack on the inviolability and dignity of the person. The Pope's declaration reverses longstanding Church doctrine, which previously allowed for the death penalty in rare circumstances. And in the Philippines, labor unions and press freedom groups are condemning a violent crackdown on striking workers at a major food condiment producer. On July 30th, police joined with security guards to attack a picket line outside a Nutra Asia plant north of Manila. At least 10 people were injured, 20 others arrested, one journalist was injured during the strike, and five Filipino journalists were arrested, prompting condemnation from the Committee to Protect Journalists. All five were later released without charge. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. Org, the War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We begin in California, where tens of thousands of residents have been forced to evacuate as deadly wildfires continue to rage across the state. The worst wildfire, the Car Fire, has engulfed more than 100,000 acres and destroyed more than 1,000 homes in and around Redding, California, making it the sixth most destructive fire in the state's history. Authorities said Wednesday that 16 of the largest wildfires burning in California have scorched 320,000 acres, an area larger than the entire city of Los Angeles. Eight people have died in the fires so far. This is Cal Fire Operations Chief Steve Crawford describing the aggressive nature of this year's wildfires. Every single person that I've talked to so far has made the mention that I don't know why it's doing what it's doing. It's burning differently. It's burning uh, more aggressive um, than, than it has in years past. And I know we say that every year, but it, it's, it's unprecedented. It's, it's, it's burning in every direction all at the same time. And we've got, even though we have multiple resources, the way that it's burning, the intensity that's burning, uphill, downhill, even if it doesn't have a strong wind on it, it's, it's burning as if it's got a Santa Ana wind. Or, or a strong 60-mile-an-hour, 70-mile-an-hour wind. Wildfires are also surging across other parts of the West. In Colorado, the third-largest fire in the state's recorded history continues to grow near Garland, in the southern part of the state. The spring fire has so far consumed more than 100 homes and led to the evacuation of more than 2,000 people. In Washington, a wildfire dubbed the Milestone 90 fire had grown to some 11,000 acres by Wednesday. Fires also rage in Arizona, Idaho and Oregon. The Fires in the U.S. come amidst a month of deadly climate-fueled weather across the world. Seven fires remained active in the forests of northeastern Ontario, Canada, as of Wednesday, after days of efforts by the local firefighters to put out the raging fire. More than 50 fires burn across Sweden, including in Swedish Lapland inside the Arctic Circle. And in Greece, at least 90 people have died as uncontrollable wildfires swept through neighborhoods outside the capital Athens. The blazes were in the worst fires in more than a decade. Christos Zarephos, a climate scientist at the Academy of Athens explained what a combination of environmental factors created a perfect storm for the blaze to spread quickly in what was a lush, densely populated area. Well, it was definitely a high-risk zone. Um, it was called a paradise, but uh, as we, we all have seen, a paradise to be lost. They, there will be more common, more frequent extreme weather phenomena because the climate globally is being destabilized, that we have added a cushion or an additional source of heat that is produced by humans, the burning of fossil fuels. Climate scientists have linked increasingly scorching temperatures and deadly wildfires to climate change. For more, we're joined by Brenda Eckersall, senior climate scientist, director of climate science for the Climate and Energy Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Dr. Eckersall. Talk Good about to be here. What's happening in California right now, what people are calling fire tornadoes, and this link to climate change? Well, 
what we know with climate change, one of the clearest signals is heat. And what we see is more occurrences of extreme heat. And when that happens, during periods that are normally a drier time of season in a location, or in places that are semi-arid, such as California has had multi-years of drought, this is the kind of toxic combination that can create very dangerous conditions, so that the wildfires are hotter, more severe, and more dangerous for people living nearby, dealing with the smoke. Also, if you are in the areas such as Greece or in areas that are fueled by Santa Ana winds that are much fiercer, stronger, blowing these fires at speeds that are very hard for people to escape. Let's go to California Governor Jerry Brown speaking at a news conference Wednesday about the fires raging across California. Yes, this is serious. Uh, fires are now a more part of our, of our ordinary experience. Uh, the predictions that things would get drier and hotter uh, are occurring, and that will continue. Uh, we're in quite a cycle, uh, but the predictions that I see that the more serious uh, predictions of uh, warming and fires uh, to occur later in the century, uh, 2040 or 2050, they're now occurring uh, in real time. And you can expect, unfortunately, uh, that to keep intensifying in California and throughout the Southwest. This has even become an issue in the governor's race, of course, since it is uh, so major as it sweeps through California, with the Republican candidate John Cox, a climate change denier, saying it's a waste of time to discuss these issues. We've just got to discuss readiness um, uh, versus Gavin Newsom, uh, who has been championing the issue of dealing with climate change, Brenda Eckwurzel. What does climate change mean when you see it through this lens, when it comes to dealing with these massive crises, this term fire tornadoes that's now being used? What we know is that, without a doubt, if you have hotter temperatures, it's just basic physics. You evaporate more water from your uh, lakes and rivers, and you're drying out the soils. And the vegetation needs more water in these conditions, and it's, it's, sent, it's losing more water to the atmosphere. So you can create a tinderbox condition if you happen to have a natural lightning strike or uh, a careless spark by human activity causing a fire. So what we see in the western U.S., that large wildfires are uh, lasting longer, they're more severe, and they are burning more acres. Uh, the other consequence is that, uh, as you said, um, the, the threat to the dangerous situation for people living on the front lines of a wildfire situation uh, it's putting more wildfire hotshots, as they're called, who are fi bravely fighting these fires, their lives on the line, as well as people and property who are in the way of the fire. And that's why we need very advanced science to warn people about the conditions over the long term and what we can do, and also in the near term, in the fast warning systems to get people out of the way and heed these warnings. These fires are much faster and stronger than we've ever seen before, and that's in part because of burning coal, oil and gas. Well, Brenda, we just heard uh, California governor saying, uh, saying himself that these fires are likely to keep intensifying uh, and increasing in the coming uh, decades. So what steps do you think can be taken now? Are there any preventative steps uh, can, th that the state can take uh, uh, to prevent this from happening or at least to mitigate uh, it from happening? Luckily, Governor Brown has been a real leader in taking the state to reducing its own emissions of heat-trapping gases. So that has been, uh, the first and foremost, the best situation. You have to lower the baseline conditions. A scientists call it a hot drought, and when it's a hot drought, the more dangerous conditions can result, such as wildfires, uh, water resources uh, for drinking water and the agricultural sector are at risk. So that's number one honor the Paris Climate Agreement locally, within states, cities, and countries around the world who are trying to keep the globe to below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial. Number two, create a bigger fire perimeter of safe area around structures or cherished resources that we need to protect. Make sure that there's a big distance between human activities and what's called the wild land urban interface. Uh, that is where we see a lot of fire activity starting. So we have to stop these fires from starting in the first place, unless under natural conditions. And, and thirdly, we have to protect people's uh, public health.
Talking about uh, policy, the Trump administration has argued that increased fuel efficiency standards endanger the lives of drivers. Documents seen by the Associated Press show administration officials are preparing to argue more fuel-efficient cars will cause drivers to spend more time behind the wheel, leading to more deaths on roads and highways, attacking the fuel efficiency standards of California. The significance of this. Uh, that's counterintuitive, because every study shows that when we have fuel-efficient cars, we're putting less carbon into the atmosphere if they're powered by fossil fuel and not a renewable fuel source. And that means cleaner air for Californians, uh, for any city, for any area where you have ground-level ozone, because there are three ingredients for smog fossil fuel, uh, volatile organic carbon, or from uh, vegetation, such as forests. They can cr create that as well. Sunlight and hot temperatures. And as we warm the globe, we have this climate penalty with ground-level smog, because we create more uh, of the smog because we have hotter temperatures during the day than we did a century ago. Brenda, can you say a little about um, the populations, the more vulnerable populations th that are impacted the most uh, by these wildfires in California and also elsewhere, the, the effects of uh, climate change-induced environmental uh, uh, disasters on vulnerable populations? Sure. Uh, what we saw, for example, if you look at other parts of the world, uh, in the when there was a combination of wildfire plus extreme heat in Russia, uh, studies showed that that was made possible more severe because of climate change. But the high mortality was the combination of smoke from these peat fires in the high northern latitudes and, and the high temperatures combining to create a, a very d dire health risk. And there were many tens of thousands of people that died. Also, a study in 2003, heat wave, what we found, Stott and colleagues, uh, scientists studying this heat wave found that the double the risk of this horrendously tragic heat wave that lost the lives of tens of thousands of people was doubled because of climate change. What we know is that a subsequent study by Mitchell and colleagues that in central Paris, the heat mortality from that event was 70 percent of that uh, excess heat mortality was due to human-induced climate change. And 20 percent of the heat mortality in London was due to human-induced climate change in that 2003 tragic event. We're going to go to break, and we're going to ask you to stay with us. Brenda Eckwurzel, senior climate scientist with the Union of Concerned Scientists, speaking to us, <clears throat> speaking to us from Boston. This is Democracy Now! When we come back— uh, speaking to us from Washington, D.C. When we come back, we'll continue this hour-long discussion. We'll also be joined by Nat Rich, who has written the piece in The New York Times magazine that is the entire magazine, only the second time in New York Times history that one article covers the entire magazine. The issue? Climate change. Stay with us. I never meant to call you when Never meant to call you in pain. Rain by Prince. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. With unprecedented fires, floods and heat waves sweeping the globe, 2018 is on track to be the fourth hottest year on record.
the regions most affected by the disastrous effects of global warming are overwhelmingly not the countries that have contributed the most to climate change. According to the 2018 Global Cri Climate Risk Index, released by the public policy group German Watch, the nine countries most affected by climate change in the past 20 years are developing nations, including Honduras, Haiti, Burma, Pakistan and Bangladesh. USA Today reports that, quote, Pakistan contributes less than 1 percent of the world's greenhouse gases blamed for causing global warming, yet its 200 million people are among the world's most vulnerable victims of the growing consequences of climate change. The Indian government says more than 500 people have died as a result of flooding and heavy rains in recent weeks. In Iran, there is a chronic shortage of water, and it's estimated there is some form of drought in 97 percent of the country. Meanwhile, in the U.S., a report by Media Matters found major broadcast networks mentioned climate change just once during the two-week global heat wave in July, despite reporting on the heat wave at least 127 times. The analysis tracked news reports by ABC, CBS and NBC. Well, for more, we're going to Albany, New York, to speak with Rob Nixon, professor in the humanities and environment at Princeton University, author of Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, for which he won a number of awards, including the American Book Award. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Professor Nixon. Can you talk you. about, I mean, I mean, this title, Slow Violence, what do you mean by it and relate it to what is happening to the environment in the developing world? Yes, so by slow violence, I mean uh, the violence of postponed effects. So violence that typically isn't recognizable as violence because it's not spectacular. It may be seen in, in media terms as drama deficient. So just to take one example, something like Agent Orange, where you have a 12-year uh, war in Vietnam and the casualties are framed by that uh, public perception, but the impacts, the ongoing uh, casualties and uh, public health effects uh, last for, for decades and generations. So I think there's something um, analogous going on with climate change is that we have the, um, the postponement of the consequences. And so what we're looking at, in, in effect, um, is, is a kind of intergenerational theft of the uh, conditions of life itself. What do you mean, in the second part of the, the, the title of your book, what is the environmentalism uh, of the poor, and how does it relate to slow violence? So. It, you know, I think there's still a widespread public perception that even if environmentalism is an, is an urgent cause, it's a relatively elite one and it is espoused disproportionately by the well-off. And so what I was trying to do in the, in the, in the course of the book is to um, bring to the surface some of the genealogies of uh, environmental activism by the poor, uh, who are the people who are most impacted by the fallout of the failures to uh, global failures to to uh, mitigate and uh, forestall uh, climate change effects, uh, and th there are these there's very long and deep traditions of of activism among those who have contributed least, uh, as we've been saying, but are are, are most precariously positioned uh, in the front lines of the climate change crisis. Let's turn to one of the most high-profile protests against government inaction on climate change. For the U.N. Climate Summit in Paris in 2015, Yeb Sanyo, the former lead climate negotiator for the Philippines, walked more than 900 miles from Rome to Paris as part of a people's pilgrimage for climate action. Sanyo, again, the top Philippines climate negotiator in 2013, when Typhoon Haiyan, one of the strongest cyclones in recorded history, devastated the Philippines, killing thousands of people, the devastation coinciding with the 2013 U.N. COP summit in Warsaw, Poland, where Yeb Sanyo made headlines with an emotional plea for action on climate change. Such as Haiyan and its impacts represent a sobering reminder to the international community that we cannot afford to delay climate action. Warsaw must deliver on enhancing ambition and should muster the political will to address climate change and build that important bridge 
towards Peru and Paris. It, may, it might be said that it must be poetic justice that the typhoon Haiyan was so big that its diameter spanned the distance between Warsaw and Paris. Mr. President, in Doha, we asked, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? If not here, then where? But here, in Warsaw, we may very well ask these same forthright questions. What my country is going through as a result of this extreme climate event is madness. The climate crisis is madness. Mr. President, we can stop this madness right here in Warsaw. So that was Yev Sanyo, when he was the lead climate negotiator for the Philippines in 2013, speaking in Warsaw. Of course, Democracy Now! was there, covering every COP. The next year, when we were in Lima, Peru, suddenly Yev Sanyo was no longer a climate negotiator for the Philippines. Uh, and the word was that his outspokenness led to his ouster. But it hasn't stopped him from being a climate environmentalist, as he continues to march uh, around uh, the environment and for climate action. Rob Nixon. Yes, I, you know, I think that um, what, what we're seeing, and, and uh, this was, there was a no noticeable shift around 2011 at the Durban Climate Summit, uh, what we're seeing is alliances of uh, figures from the Global South, and some of them, as you say, subsequently get ousted. But the creation of alliances of people, say, from small island nations, uh, from uh, mid-level uh, economies, from uh, countries in the Sahel in Africa, some of these countries that are, are exceedingly vulnerable, uh, getting together and trying to create some kind of um, choral effect uh, in an effort to be heard where the, the most decisive players like the U.S. and China are, are, dragging, are dragging their feet. So I think that the, 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 there has been a shift in who is being heard, who, who is uh, speaking out. Um, and, and to a very large degree, the U.S. is an outlier, both in the history of institutionalized denial of climate change, the anti-science, the funding of anti-science, uh, and also clearly in terms of the consequential character of, of what U.S. leadership would mean or would have meant. Uh, Rob Nixon, I just want to turn to a couple of the statistics which are so remarkable uh, uh, that you've cited in terms of the massive disparities uh, uh, for, of countries that are responsible uh, uh, for, principally responsible for uh, the, the greenhouse gas emissions um, and effects. You say, California residents burn more gasoline than the 900 million inhabitants of all of Africa. That's 54 countries combined. Uh, meanwhile, a one-way flight from Los Angeles to New York produces more carbon emissions than the average Nigerian does in a whole year. So uh, could you elaborate on that and to what extent you think that's being taken into account at all uh, in discussions of climate change? Right. I think that I think there is um, a, an increasing acknowledgement that we need a concerted global effort. But within that concerted global effort, we need to accommodate uh, unequal histories of who has contributed uh, to the, the, the greenhouse gases historically and uh, who contributes in the present. Uh, and so th uh, I mean, that, that is an absolutely critical component of what is an existential crisis for the species. But what I would emphasize here is that the um, uh, sort of institutionalized funding, if you like, institutionalized gaslighting of, uh, of America around uh, climate science through the, the, the funding by the right of uh, climate skepticism, climate denial, uh, and the, the effectively the, the bankrolling of inaction. Uh, this has coincided with a period of, uh, of neoliberal globalization. So going back to, say, the late 70s. And what we see there is, is the, the way in which the exacerbation of the climate crisis is inseparable from rising levels of inequality in society after society. So, I mean, just to take the U.S., we know that uh, 
uh, around 1980, the, the disparity between the average wage of a CEO and a worker was something like um, 1 to 80. That is now uh, in, the, in the vicinity of 1 to 280. Uh, and, and this has been replicated in society after society. And so I, I do think that we need to uh, think through simultaneously the crisis in inequality and the climate crisis, because the people who are in the front lines are the most vulnerable, and typically uh, they have contributed the least historically to the problem. We want to bring in Nathaniel Rich as well to this conversation, writer at large for The New York Times Magazine. His piece, Losing Earth, The Decade We Almost Stopped Climate Change, published August 1st in a special edition of The New York Times Magazine dedicated to climate change. It's just the second time in the magazine's history that it dedicated an issue to just one article. The story tracking the 10-year period from 1979 to 1989, the decade Nathaniel Rich claims humankind first came to a comprehensive understanding of climate change but failed to address its extreme dangers while there was still time. The story produced with the support of the Pulitzer Center. Nathaniel, welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Thanks. So talk about um, this major piece that you wrote and why you chose this time period, 79 to 89. So, by 1979, there's a strong scientific consensus about the fundamental science of, of climate change. Um, and there were major reports by the, at the highest levels of, of the government about the problem, and there started to emerge an effort by a handful of scientists and um, acti an activist um, and, and some politicians to move the issue. And over the course of the decade, it, uh, they developed a plan, which is essentially um, a global treaty, uh, which would become the IPCC process. And they made steady, if, if uh, you know, some up and, with some up and downs, progress towards the end of the decade. And uh, other things that's significant about that period is that the issue was not a partisan issue. There were prominent Republicans in Congress and administration, Republican administrations, who were strongly supportive of a major major climate policy. Um, and the fossil fuel industry was had not uh, locked arms and, and coordinated the uh, what we now see is this history of propaganda, disinformation campaigns, um, bribing politicians and, and the entire Republican Party. And so that there was this 10-year period uh, where we came very close to a serious consideration of a binding emissions treaty. Um, and we failed. So th I wanted to tell the story of, of how that came to be um, and why we didn't succeed. Well, what happened in 1989? Like, what changed so dramatically? So there's the, the na I guess the most narrow political answer is that George Bush took the White House. Uh, George Bush won. 1988, he campaigned um, saying things like, those who are worried about the greenhouse effect, uh, solving the greenhouse effect, um, haven't heard of the White House effect, and when I'm in the White House, we're going to solve it. Dan Quayle in the vice presidential uh, uh, campaign also spoke about this. And the head of his EPA, William Riley, was a strong uh, proponent of the IPCC, beginning IPCC process. Uh, as they start to meet, at the, at the, the piece ends essentially at the first high level diplomatic meeting that's held in the Netherlands um, to, to discuss the idea of emissions reductions and hard targets. Um, for the treaty that would become the Rio Earth, at the, at the Rio Earth Summit. And uh, within the White House, Governor John Sununu, who was the chief of staff, was very skeptical of the science, had some conspiracy theories about the whole movement, and essentially single-handedly won uh, an infighting with William Riley and others in the administration, and got made sure that there was no um, binding target that the U.S. would agree with. And that is the beginning of the derailing. Um, and shortly thereafter, the industry gets involved. Well, I'd like to turn to, to some of the criticism that the piece, the New York Times Magazine piece that you wrote, uh, has received uh, from Inside Climate News, which won a Pulitzer Prize for exposing how Exxon knew fossil fuels caused global warming as early as the 1970s, but hid that information from the public. In a series of tweets Wednesday, Inside Climate News wrote, quote, the tale of U.S. climate inaction spans 70 years, and it continues to this day. 
In a subsequent re uh, tweet, they went on to write, quote, once the serious threat of political action to control GHG emissions, that greenhouse gas emissions, emerged, fossil fuel interests worked hard to undermine the scientific basis for urgent action, using tools like uh, misinformation campaigns and campaign donations. Uh, to it worked, they say, unquote. They went on to write, quote, as early as the 1950s, oil companies worked on strategies to sow doubt about science that could lead to regulation of their own air emissions. The Smoke and Fumes Committee at the American Petroleum Institute, the oil industry's main lobbyist, worked to discredit the science surrounding smog that its own researchers ultimately confirmed. So could you respond to those points? Yeah, I don't um, see that as a criticism. Everything you just mentioned is in the article. I, you know, I don't expect people to have read a 35, 40,000 uh, word article on the day it's published. Um, but I think um, so. Explain but, those points. Oh yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so as I as I write about, um, you start to see industry, um, American Petroleum Institute, Exxon, as was well documented in their series, which is fantastic um, and was a great source for my piece, um, and I credited them. Uh, they uh, start to understand. It's clear they understand the science um, as early as at least the 1950s, and. Repeatedly over the decades, um, they publish reevaluations <laughs> of the science, come to the exact same conclusions, which are the same conclusions that have been met, uh, reached by government scientists and independent scientists and so on, um, and they don't take action. And that continues through the 80s. There are a couple other, you know, details there. Um, I would distinguish that from the, de co the coordinated disinformation campaign, the bribing of scientists, the bribing of politicians, um, the enormous PR campaigns modeled after the tobacco industry's efforts. And it's certainly true that that didn't really start happening until you get uh, with force, until you get in the, the lead up to the Rio Earth Summit, when there's the possibility of, of real action. Um, at that point, uh, what my reporting shows is the White House had already checked out, uh, and there was no real desire within the White House. And this was White the House White House of Bush, um, George H. W. George H. W. Bush, um, and uh, so I don't dispute any of any of that. And and my point is simply that um, by the time you get to the end of the '80s, uh, that the, the robust effort hasn't started, and that. Not only did Exxon know and API, but the government knew. There were articles in Time and Life in the 1950s uh, on through. So this wasn't a secret. And I think there's um, a confusion, even among people who follow the issue fairly closely, closely, that this started with Jim Hansen's testimony. And Jim Hansen is one of the two main figures in my piece. This was a 1988, Sorry, 1988 uh, hearing um, during the hottest summer ever. And of uh, droughts and, and, and wildfires. James Sanson, a leading climate scientist who is head of the Goddard Center, the NASA Center for um, uh, Studies on Climate. Right. So the piece follows his story going back to the late 70s, and he was testifying at hearings throughout the decade. Um, and so there's a long history that um, I find actually more damning that leads up um, even to that point. Uh, so that there was a failure even before industry could could then essentially uh, cement the paralysis. Well, I think some of the the, the key points uh, that that people seem to have taken climate researchers and activists have taken issue with is that you write a common bogeyman today is the fossil fuel industry, which in recent decades has committed to playing the role of villain with comic book bravado, and you also say that the Republican Party uh, cannot be blamed. So, could you explain why why uh, I I think that's a bit of a mystery. I wouldn't say the Republican. Party can't be blamed for the inaction that we've seen. Uh, of course, I'm not, not disputing. Not recently, but in the period that you cover, oh, 79 period, to 89. <clears throat> so I, I don't. I mean, think that's when can... Reagan was in the White yes, House, who's absolutely. apparently the most anti-environmentalist administration since Trump. Right, and, and I think they certainly were anti-environmental. And you saw, and there's a major part of the piece about when the Reagan administration uh, takes over, and it's a all hands on deck crisis um, within the environmental movement and anyone who cares about these issues. Um, so no, they were certainly not um, happy with with the idea of environmental regulations. Um, but there was no denying the issue. 
Um, and there were, you know, they did sign the ozone treaty. Now, there are some corporate pressures that helped along the way. Um, but essentially, by the end of the decade, you have a Republican administration that is making regular public statements in support of signing treaties. You have people within that administration who think it's going to happen. Uh, William Riley, I, was a, I spoke to you at length. Um, and there was, let's put it this way, there's a much stronger possibility uh, than there has been ever since. And, and I think that's an important story that needs to be told. And you have, by 1989, these corporations coming together, like Exxon, um, forming the Climate Change Coalition. Right. And so I have the story of how that happens, which is, after 1988, Hansen testifies. I interviewed the head of the American Petroleum Institute's environmental section and his boss, the number two in the whole company, who had been the head of the environmental program um, the whole decade, Bill O'Keefe. Uh, and they told me, and they're very, you know, they're not, uh, they don't equivocate about what happened in the 90s, um, and they're proud of it. Um, but they said after Hansen's hearing, people started to perk up. There started to be concern. There were 32 legis uh, bills filed in Congress uh, about climate policy. And they started to hold meetings, informational meetings at API. Um, and similar work was being done at Exxon to try to formulate a strategy. And that was the beginning of a, of a hard turn. Um, but there were, you know, it progressed. Originally, it was, uh, let's make sure to highlight uncertainty. Um, let's make sure to be a participant in any conversation about regulation. Um, and let's make sure not to endorse any policy that hurts the bottom line. So you see the formation of it, but then it gets into pure um, fantasy, denialism and all of that. Um, and that's a story that's been very well told. And I felt like there was by great reporters, um, and I didn't feel like I could add anything to that narrative. But I did feel like I could add something to the prehistory of that. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. Our guests are, um, well, the guest that we're talking to right now, Nathaniel Rich, has written the entire issue of The New York Times magazine uh, on climate change, the piece called Losing Earth, the Decade We Almost Stopped Climate Change. And when we come back, climate scientist Brenda Eckwurzel will also join the discussion, as will Rob Nixon, author of Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute. Sayan by Grace Nono. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh as we talk about this mass crisis in the world today, the crisis of climate change, fire tornadoes in California, the monsoon season so strong right now in India, just in the last week, some well over 500 people killed. Um, we are making a link between the issue that meteorologists talk about all over, this extreme weather, but to climate change, which they rarely mention in the U.S. corporate media. Um, studies have repeatedly, like Media Matters, been done to show, no matter how many times they reference the firestorms in California, only once on NBC, ABC and CBS in the last few weeks did CBS mention the link to climate change. 
Uh, Brenda Eckwurzel, your senior climate scientist, director of climate science for climate and energy program at the Union of Concerned Scientists, Rob Nixon with us, author of Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of Poor, and Nathaniel Rich, who's got the whole New York Times magazine under his name this week, with his piece, Losing Earth, The Decade We Almost Stop Climate Change. Brenda, if you could respond to the New York Times piece and also talk about what we were just talking about with Nathaniel, uh, talk about the issue of the power of uh, the corporations, um, uh, specifically um, 90 corporations having been responsible for two-thirds of humanity's greenhouse gas emissions, an issue that Nathaniel highlights in his piece. Yes. Uh, it's, it's really important, the early history, because the bipartisan nature of people listening to the science, trying to design policy to solve it, and try to get the economic and policy considerations all in a line and start rolling up our sleeves and working on this issue, is really important. What happened? Why did it change to the world we have today, where uh, people even are denying the science and are—, are sticking their heads in the sand and not rolling up their sleeves uh, at, at national level in the United States. And what you mentioned was the coverage of these extreme events that the science is clear are have very strong ties to climate change, such as when you have too much water or too little water, we've changed the hydrologic cycle. So uh, that feeds into how severe these extreme events are. In fact, we're seeing in a new normal world we have today with one degree Celsius warming that our infrastructure around the world is not able to handle the flooding that happens after a wildfire, for example, such as what happened in California uh, in the town of uh, the region of Montecito that had these devastating debris flows after a wildfire had scorched the hillsides and then the subsequent very high rainfall, which we know is another situation that's changing with climate change, falls on that parched soil, and it unleashes very dangerous debris flows and, and destroying homes, and unfortunately, people are losing their lives. And, and you mentioned other, other events around the world, such as in Pakistan, where there's been extreme flooding, extreme heat in India uh, and, and in Japan, and, and I could go on. So what's different today? is that the predictions that the scientists knew in the 50s and 60s and 70s and the scientists working within the fossil fuel industry knew. Unfortunately, we're seeing them play out today. So I think we have different uh, chance today to, to set this straight and, and to roll up our sleeves and make a difference. And states such as California, states such as Texas, states such as uh, the northeastern states and, and, and other state cities all around the nation in the U.S. are trying to stick with the Paris Climate Agreement. And many countries all around the world have some skin in the game. They're all trying to help solve this problem. And the best part is nations who are on the front lines are holding the world accountable. And that's why the Paris Climate Agreement has even more aggressive targets than uh, what would be if it was just a developing nation uh, agreement. Well, Rob Nixon, uh, you said earlier that uh, on the question of climate change, uh, both in its its perception uh, uh, and the way that the uh, successive U.S. governments have, have talked about it, well, in particular the Trump administration now, that the U.S. is an outlier. Uh, could you talk specifically about the way in which, as you say, anti-science uh, has been propagated in the U.S. and the role of the media uh, uh, in bringing climate change to attention when they cover climate uh, change? Uh, climate-related disasters, as we've seen in the last uh, few months? Yes, I, I think one of the successes of the, the right um, dissemination of anti-science has been that uh, climate change and global warming are perceived in the U.S. to a far greater extent than they are in most of the world as politicized terms. And as a result, the corporate media in particular often steers clear of them. Uh, and that has something to do with the, the ownership of the media. It has something to do with the uh, advertising base and so forth. Uh, but to, to, you know, I think we, one cannot overestimate the degree to which um, the, the funding of anti-science in the U.S. has been far, far greater, you know, more than 100 times greater than in any other country in the world. And this has permeated public perceptions and created a kind of a skittishness uh, 
around using that language which is now perceived as polarizing in a way, say, that uh, scientific language about gravity is not. Um, and, and that is the, the, the result of a very concerted campaign. What I do see shifting is uh, a, a generational perception of what the political priorities are. And if I look at my students, uh, which I've taught in you know, Wisconsin, New Jersey, elsewhere, if I look at the, the say, millennial generation, the issue of debt, um, climate debt, student debt, is, is right at the forefront of their political priorities. We're also in a better position technologically than we've ever been to actually act upon uh, uh, shifting the, 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 the source of our energy uh, to renewables, uh, removing uh, subsidies to fossil fuel, uh, also increasing um, the, the storage power in batteries, which has been a, a, a long-standing obstacle. So technologically, we're, we're in a very good position. It's a question of aligning uh, those technological possibilities with uh, international governance. I uh, want to just say, so a, we just got yeah. this breaking news, uh, reading from The Washington Post, the Trump administration Thursday announced plans to freeze fuel efficiency requirements for the nation's cars and trucks through 2026, a massive regulatory rollback likely to spur a legal battle with California and other states, as well as create potential upheaval in the nation's automotive market. Re uh, the proposal representing an abrupt reversal of the findings that the government reached under President Obama when regulators argued requiring more fuel-efficient vehicles would improve public health, combat climate change, and save consumers money without compromising safety. Um, your response to this, Nathaniel Rich, this is in the midst of the fire tornadoes of California. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's an understatement to say that what the Republican Party is doing now and what industry has propagated for the last couple decades um, will be considered in the future and probably the very near future um, as crimes against humanity. And I think that you know, the conversation that we're having today, um, one of the things that was most striking to me about reading some of these conversations that were being held in the 80s, it's identical. Um, there, there's nothing we're saying today that wasn't said in 1980, um, including the North-South issues and, uh, and developing country issues. Um, and I, 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 it, it makes me wonder if we um, have come about this in the right way. I mean, I, my, my, my sense in having these conversations is that we've failed as a society to articulate an adequate moral vision of this problem. Um, and which is not to put aside the, the moral vision of industry, which is obviously sociopathic. Um, but, but I don't think we understand exactly what's coming, um, and we, don't, we certainly don't feel it uh, on, on a, the level of the society. Um, and I think the only, my feeling is that the only way to, to begin to get there um, is to understand how we got here. And, and that's, that's, the, that's part of the reason I wanted to write this article. But What most surprised you in your research? I think just that you, reading transcripts of a meeting in 1980 with, uh, you know, assembled, there's a meeting in the piece, uh, a two dozen of the top experts, uh, including uh, Henry Shaw from Exxon, policy people from Congress and so on, um, meet together at the, at the directive of Congress to develop climate policy. And they have a, a three-day meeting in which they talk about every, everything we could possibly talk about today. And they all agree. Even, you know, Shaw is not disputing anything. And at the end of the meeting, they can't even formulate a single statement that they agree on, a single sentence, let alone policy. Brenda Eckwurzel, what gives you most hope right now? What gives me the most hope is that we are what we call, uh, a, a friend of mine uh, and colleague and a scientist says, we're on the luxury end of the exponential curve. So those conversations back there aren't too different from today because we're just feeling the full brunt of climate change that we've already uh, delivered today. However, it has a legacy of centuries that we will be unleashing sea level rise because heat trapping gases 10, 15 to 45 percent of carbon dioxide we release in the atmosphere today will be trapping heat day in, day out over a thousand years. So, that and Rob Nixon, idea let me ask you on the issue important. of hope. Yeah, well, I, I would come back to the technological changes and the generational changes. I think the priorities in terms of mitigation, adaptation, resilience, 
that we see from um, five seconds. Young, yep, younger younger people today uh, give us hope, but there has to be uh, a massive surge of concerted action. Rob Nixon, author of Slow Violence and the Environmentalists and the Poor, Brenda Eckersall of the Union of Concerned Scientists, and Nathaniel Rich will link to your piece in The New York Times, Losing Earth, the Decade We Almost Stopped Climate Change. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thanks so much for joining us.